Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted that you're able to join us this morning, and we know that uh, these 8 a.m. sessions, um, uh, we often have people trickling in through the morning, which is perfectly fine. We're so thrilled that you can be here today. My name is Danielle Martin. I'm a family doc at Women's College Hospital, and I'm the chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine here at the University of Toronto. And before I welcome our uh, guest speaker, who I'm just thrilled is able to join us today, I want to just say a few words about this speaker series, the purpose of it, and the wonderful image that uh, you see on your screen, which we have permission to use as the background art for the series, which is really about how we can best support the communities we serve and the communities we wish to serve better. So let me say a few words about this image. This image you see is a wonderful work of art from an artist named Meryl McMaster, a Canadian artist with Plains, Cree, British and Dutch ancestry. And I was captivated by it. I'm captivated by all of Meryl's work. Um, uh, but this one in particular, I felt uh, really spoke to what I dreamed we would be able to do with this speaker series. It's entitled, Lead Me to Places I Could Never Find on My Own. And it's a part two of a two-part diptych from a spectacular series called As Immense as the Sky. And if you haven't had a chance to get to know her work, we'll post her website in the chat. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about this uh, piece in Meryl's own words, because it really speaks to what we're trying to do with this speaker series. She says, stories of the constellations have been passed down over the generations within both Indigenous and non-Indigenous cultures. Humans and animals have used the stars to navigate for thousands of years and still do to this day. As the stars become hidden by light pollution, we start to lose our way. This image was taken at the Badlands in Grasslands National Park, a dark sky preserve and a preservation area for one of the largest tracts of national, natural grassland in North America. The Badlands were not touched by glaciation during the last ice age, so the landscape reveal, revels isolated boots, weathered outcroppings, eroded gullies, and more. Perched atop my hat are the indigo bunting birds who use the stars to navigate. Carrying the universe, they lead me to the stars as I seek answers in the sky. So for this series, I hope that we can draw on many different traditions of navigation and chart our own way as a department and as the discipline of family medicine. And now I'm just delighted to welcome our guest, Medhat Madi, who, as, uh, as you all know, is President and CEO of the YMCA of Greater Toronto and President of YMCA Ontario. Medhat really is a community builder. And as we've been talking in our department about what is the C in DFCM all about, what does it mean to be a department committed to community, he's one of the people I wanted most to speak with in this series. He's been involved with the Y for over 45 years as a member, a volunteer, a donor, and a leader. And he brings a deep understanding of the social determinants of health, as we'll hear this morning, as well as a conviction that we owe every individual in our communities the opportunity to reach their full potential. As the leader of the largest not-for-profit child care provider in Canada, Medhat is committed to advancing the YMCA's vision of vibrant communities where everyone can shine. Uh, I met Medhat when I was a teenager at my very first job, my after-school job all through high school was at the Metro Central YMCA, uh, renting out locks and checking people in um, and uh, giving out towels and cleaning the locker rooms. And he was the manager of the Metro Central Y at that time. So um, we've known each other for many years and um, um, I, I dare say, watched each other's uh, careers grow. And uh, it's been such a, a pleasure. He's such an inspiring community leader. He spearheaded the opening of the Cooper Coo Family YMCA, the Wagner Green YMCA for Youth in Need of Housing, the YMCA Sprott House for 2S LGBTQ plus youth, and most recently, the YMCA in Vaughan. He is the lead, leading the development of two additional centers of community in the GTA, uh, so he's managing some really big construction projects. As an immigrant who wel was welcomed to Canada by the YMCA as a young man, Medhat believes strongly in the power of social inclusion to help people of all ages and stages reach their full potential. He lives in Toronto with his wife. They have three children and one grandchild. He's a fan of classical music and a tennis lover who started working at the YMCA in his early 20s as a part-time tennis coach. So in today's session, we're going to explore how primary care providers 
and family medicine as a discipline can partner with organizations like the Y to bring services to people and communities where they are, where they live, work, and play. Medhat, thank you for joining us, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Danielle, and uh, and, and I, do I do remember those days when you were working at the Metro Central Y, and uh, and it's great to see how uh, how how things have evolved. Uh, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm really I'm really uh, uh, humbled to be here. Um, when I got the invitation, I wasn't quite sure how I could contribute. So you know, Danielle told me just to kind of talk about what we do at the Y in terms of getting out to community and and to think about uh, what what kind of ideas uh, we could apply. From our learnings to uh, to 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 family practice, so I'll do my best to to achieve that. Um, so what, what I thought I would do is um, first of all give you a bit of a picture of the why itself, uh, so you, you get a sense of uh, uh, who we are and and where we're coming from, and then talk a little bit more about. Uh, um, uh, uh, about the some of the ideas and, and the learnings we've had. So next slide, please. And next slide. So just to start off with, um, we are the YMCA of Greater Toronto. We are a charity. Uh, our mission is to ignite the potential in people, to help them grow, lead, and give back to their communities. And our vision is vibrant communities where everyone can shine. And we work with six values, core values, inclusiveness, integrity, kindness, optimism, respect, and well-being. Next slide, please. So this is our reach. Uh, we're in over 450 locations across the greater Toronto area. Uh, three, over 300 of them are child care centers. As Danielle mentioned, we're the largest provider of uh, not-for-profit child care in the country. Uh, and then you can see uh, the different programs uh, that we offer. Uh, and as, as Danielle mentioned, we've, we've opened up some new uh, big centers and uh, we currently have um, what I would say uh, about 12 large centers in the community uh, that I'll speak to, I'll speak about a bit later. Next slide, please. So just to give you a, a flavor of uh, our programming. Now, this is, this is during a pandemic year and before the pandemic, you could triple a lot of these numbers that you're seeing. Um, but, um, uh, we, you know, we, we operate camps, child care services, education and training, employment, uh, immigrant settlement services, global initiatives, uh, health and fitness, which we're known for, uh, significant youth services, uh, youth leadership development, uh, and um, and then we have uh, something that's maybe not well known about the wise. We have a number of Im uh, addiction uh, services that we offer for for young people. Next slide, please. So you know, COVID came along. Uh, and we've all been affected by it in many ways. Um, we were able to respond. Uh, it was very difficult uh, for, for everyone. Um, and it was unprecedented in terms of some of the things we had to do. Uh, one of the challenges we have we had at the Y is, we have a bit of a saying that when, uh, when, there's, when, when there are times of crisis in the community, the Y will uh, step up and we'll open our doors even wider, uh, which, which was a pre pretty difficult because we had to close our doors. Uh, but all, although we closed our doors, we continued to operate services, uh, virtual Y memberships. Uh, we operated emergency child care centers for children of, uh, of healthcare workers uh, and essential workers. We created an online community for older adults. Uh, we continue to do our shelter and transitional housing for youth. Uh, we continue to support job seekers. Uh, we we operated three food banks and one one big uh, food sorting uh, food sorting center. 
uh, continue, we operated 21 summer day camps and we partnered with uh, healthcare um, around some converting some of our centers to provide COVID testing or uh, vaccination clinics. Uh, because we do have these assets that can be really redeployed during these times. And internationally, we also supported our partner wise in Peru and, uh, and Colombia and Liberia because we have a significant number of international partnerships. Uh, there are about 120 uh, YMCAs, uh, national YMCAs across, across the globe, and we partner with a number of them. So that just gives you a bit of a quick picture of how we responded to the pandemic and continue to respond to uh, what seems to be an ongoing issue. Next slide, please. And I wanted to talk a bit about when, when I showed our programs, uh, our organizing frameworks. Uh, there are four organizing frameworks that we use. Uh, one is the stages of change. Two is developmental assets, looking at the strength-based approach to our work, harm reduction, and the social determinants of health underpin how we organize and deliver our programs. So uh, it's been, uh, they're, they're, they're very in instrumental to, uh, to, to how, we, how we look at our programming. Next slide, please. And when we look at an issue such as uh, uh, you know, the pandemic or any, any other issue, we, we, we use what we call the five Ps, programs, what are, what's the program delivery solution, what are the policy solutions, what are the partnerships we could engage in, what do we need from a philanthropic perspective and, and, and people, our, our staff and volunteers and, and how we can support them through, uh, through, through issues and, and, and opportunities. Next slide, please. And we, uh, you know, we, we know that health is where you live, work, learn, and play. And so that's the whole idea of us, you know, trying to be in, in community. And, and I'll speak a little bit about family practice, um, ideas around family practice from, from what we've learned in, in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. So I value the sixth B, which is uh, meeting people where they're at. How do, we, how do we bring prevention in place in communities? And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that as well. Um, I would say our work is about 70% upstream uh, using the social determinants of health, but we also have a lot of intervention services that we offer, uh, substance abuse programming, uh, uh, support, uh, counseling, uh, gambling awareness, uh, 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 sorry, gambling awareness counseling for young people. We have a program uh, around uh, with young people around awareness around opia, opiate use. So uh, a number of a number of sort of intervention type programs that we offer, including our shelters and transitional housing units. Next slide, please. So when we look at uh, the needs in communities, um, we came up with this sort of model that's been driving our expansion. When I showed you the slides, the slide that showed over 400 locations, uh, if I showed you that same slide about uh, 10, 12 years ago, it would have been 200 locations. So we've doubled our, uh, our locations in the GTA and our, our simple model is to bring more YMCA programs to more people in more communities. And next slide, please. And the reason for that is that we, we believe that um, if we can bring our services to community, then people in those communities will have a better shot at better health. And that's uh, really something that we've been able to show through uh, a, a recent study in 2019 uh, that we partnered with the Wellesley Institute called Life in the GTA. Uh, we call it the well-being monitor, but we were also we also as part of that study uh, mapping well-being in the GTA. Uh, we were also able to look at what's the impact the Y is having, and we found that um, where there are YMCA services, those communities have a have a lift in well-being, 
as opposed to those communities that don't have uh, access to RMCA services. We also found that people who participate in the Y in, in, in many ways, whether it's through our employment programs, our immigrant settlement programs, our health and fitness programs, childcare, have a higher uh, level of well being than those who do not. So we believe that bringing services like the YMCA, this, this could apply to other community organizations into, into community is really how we can get a lift in well-being for many people. Next slide, please. And the model of well-being that we use is uh, we look at physical health, mental health, and a sense of belonging. And uh, we looked at individual attributes in terms of survey data and neighborhood characteristics. Um, and so uh, uh, this is the model that we've been working with and uh, we're, we're continuing. We will be repeating this, uh, this uh, well-being monitor study next year to see how things may have changed and how they may have been affected by the pandemic. We use this information, of course, to uh, develop and uh, organize our programming. Next slide, please. And uh, YMCAs across Ontario uh, have prevention in place as well. Uh, there's a lot of work with uh, healthcare, uh, cardiac rehabilitation uh, in a number of wise, um, diabetes prevention programs in Sudbury, youth wellness hubs, uh, healthy hearts and post-treatment and exercise program. Uh, exercise and education programs with hospitals. So those are all examples of how WISE across Ontario are, uh, are working to, uh, to support the, the health of communities. Next slide, please. So uh, I did talk about um, our capital program where we're expanding uh, our locations. Uh, I'll give you an example of one, one of the unique uh, unique uh, projects we have, which is uh, the YMC at the Bridal Town Neighborhood Center. Uh, and so this is in Scarborough Aging Court, which is a neighborhood in, uh, in, in need. Um, we're building a 150,000 square foot complex that would house a um, full service YMCA, social service agencies, as well as the dialysis unit of the Scarborough Hospital uh, Network. Uh, an interesting concept because we're not just looking at um, housing those three areas of program, but looking at seamless, uh, seamless transition and integration. Uh, so, for example, somebody who comes for they have diabetes and they need dialysis support, they can then just walk across the board to the Y and, um, and get some of the rehabilitation programs that they need. So that's an example of the kind of thinking we're, ha we're having. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, a, big, a big area for us, like for most of you is, how do we bring mental health supports and services into the community as well? Um, and, and, and so we've, we have a big initiative around, uh, around how, to, how to create mental health literacy for our staff and how do we look at how do we support mental health challenges uh, for for uh, for for people in our communities and people that we work with, as well as very important for our staff themselves. I, I think, like uh, like all of you, we're you know we're, we're having a struggles with staff burnout, staff shortages, and um, and one of our big focus foci is to really focus on how to increase the well being and supports for our staff as as we move forward and our volunteers. So, uh, so, so that's just one example. Um, another example is the Wagner Green YMCA, which is at Queen and Spadina, which is a center of community for street involved and unhoused youth. Uh, in that center, we have wraparound services, including nurse practitioners who come in, uh, counselors who come in, mental health counselors who come in. So as we're moving forward, we're, we're, we're looking at how, how to, how to um, how do we repurpose our assets in a way that provides a holistic experience and wraparound services for people? Let's go next slide, please. So uh, I, I know 
we you know we've we've learned a lot through the pandemic and before the pandemic, but I want to talk about a few things that um, I believe um, may be applicable to the work around uh, family practice and getting family practice into community. So one of the things we've learned is that convenience is very important for people. Um, years ago, I did a study. Um, uh, I did a study uh, around um, where people were coming from to YMCA's and. I found that um, about 80% of members uh, were within a three mile radius of the YMCA. And in childcare, for example, it was a one mile radius of, uh, of either where they were working or where they were uh, residing. And I sort of came up with this idea of, you know, the, the kind of the 10, 15 minute rule, which is uh, people getting to their YMCA uh, to the services they need within 10 or 15 minutes. Of course, this is before the digital age, but the whole idea of convenience of access is really critical. And you know, one one of, one of the things um, uh, I'll talk about is a bit of a bold vision that maybe uh, you, you you want to think about. Uh, one of my visions, which is a long term vision, which will happen over time, hopefully, is that anybody, any 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 youth, any child, any family, any individual in a community can find and access their YMCA services within 10 or 15 minutes of, uh, of, of, of either walking or driving or taking uh, public transit. And of course, we're also uh, going virtual and making sure that people can access, uh, access things that way. Uh, another big learning is that we need to work with people in a holistic fashion and through life stages. Uh, we have, uh, we have you know, children who come to child care, they learn how to swim at the Y, they become youth leaders, they become employees, uh, they move on to, uh, to when they become adults, they continue to be involved. So the notion that, you know, I, and I think it's the same notion with family practice as I've experienced that as a, in our own family of uh, being there for people through their life stages and understanding that people are coming in a holistic fashion. Um, uh, uh, and needed to be treated in a holistic way. A third, uh, a third learning that you know uh, I, I can see might be applicable is we have learned that consistent relationships is really important. The building of relationships, especially in uh, some of our downstream services, the building of relationships is really, really critical. And ensuring there's a consistency and a, and a predictability to those relationships. Um, one of the things that that results in is building trust. And by being in community, whether it's family practice or a YMCA or, or a child care center, by being in community on a consistent basis, building strong relationships, getting to know people in a holistic fashion. Uh, that helps to build the trust. And when the trust is built, then we can work with people in, in, in many ways through fair, various issues and various opportunities. So, you know, uh, maybe a bold vision you might want to think about is uh, a vision where people have a consistent access to quality care practices within their neighborhoods. I mean, one of the things we learned through the pandemic is, uh, especially with vaccinations and testing, is how to get how to get those services into community community settings. We've seen that across the board, whether it was at the YMCA or the Thor Thorncliffe uh, Thorncliffe uh, Center. Uh, we've seen getting those um, those services into the community as as being very effective. And a big part of what makes them effective uh, in, 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 those, in those communities is the fact that those uh, institutions that we got that, you know, healthcare worked with uh, were already trusted and already embedded in community and, 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 and were able to become um, centers for support. And then, uh, you know, at the Y, we have the same challenge that I think uh, um, healthcare has, which is the the, the strategy we develop, uh, we, need, we need to develop an urban strategy, but we also need to develop a rural strategy. Uh, it's, it's a challenge and a mistake to take an urban approach 
and try to apply it in a rural setting. So even as we're looking at child care expansion, for example, we're looking at um, in the rural settings, home child care, licensed home child care, and what that might look like, um, because it would be very difficult to build centers and, and to make them accessible. Uh, so so in, in, many, in many ways, um, thinking about the nature of the urban community we're in or the rural community um, is, is really critical in, in, in the thinking. And of course, uh, you know, how do we bring mental health services uh, through family practice? Um, you know, I'm involved in CAMH myself uh, as the chair of the board there. Uh, and I know a lot of people come to CAMH and sometimes it's hard to, to get people into, into CAMH. And part of the reason is that the systems are not interconnected and, and uh, there, are, there are challenges there. And so uh, what opportunities do we have to bring mental health supports into family practice and into community? Um, at the Y, for example, we see a lot of uh, situations where there's a need for mental health support. So, um, so you know, that's a lot of, uh, you know, we've learned a lot, but I just wanted to share, to share that. And I, I think the other thing around community that you want to keep in mind as, you're, as we're thinking about uh, bringing family practice into community is in, in community settings like ours, there's a lot of opportunity to um, to leverage volunteers and get that, get help from volunteers, and uh, so that's something that you know maybe I'd mention. As as we're thinking about the future, uh, we, we we think about you know a robust uh, volunteer program that uh, helps people help 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 the units that are going to be in community um, at the Y. Uh, a number of our programs are delivered by, by volunteers. We train them, we develop them, and they, they give back uh, very significantly. And it's, it's also very helpful to their own sense of health and well-being. So uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, uh, I just wanted to give you uh, just a grounding into the why and, and how we're working in community and think about how we can be working together um, to bring family practice into community, to make it more accessible. Um, and I'll stop there and I'll look forward to, um, to the conversation. Amazing, thank you so much, Medha. That was such a rich um, set of concepts and, uh, and the perfect way to help us begin to think about how to apply these concepts in our own work as an academic department of family medicine. So, um, and congratulations on your incredible work and the work of the why. Um, it really is very inspiring. So uh, thank you for all that you do for sure. our communities. Um, the Q and A is open friends. So uh, I, I have a few questions to kick us off and I'd like to invite people to um, ask questions of MedHat and to uh, challenge us as a, as a group about how we can take the learnings from uh, the work of the Y into the work of our own department. So please post your questions in the Q&A box and then I will, um, I will ask them. And if you like somebody else's question, you can upvote it by giving it the thumbs up. So um, I wanted to begin MedHat by coming back to the frameworks that you, um, that you posed around uh, uh, social determinants of health, harm reduction, change management. Um, these are concepts that we use a lot in family medicine. Um, and one of the things that struck me was your, um, your notion of working through partners. So you talked about how when you come into a community as the why, one of the ways that you build trust is that you build um, partnerships with um, organizations or institutions in the community uh, who already have that trust because uh, they, um, they're part of that community. Can you talk about how you do that as the why and how do you, how do you know which partners to, to reach out to? How do you, um, how do you build um, authentic partnerships with them and how do you leverage those partnerships to build trust uh, with the why? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question because it, of course it varies depending on the community and the neighborhood where uh, we're in. Uh, one of the principles we apply now as we build new wise is before, you know, before we even do the design, we um, we do community engagement. 
and we invite um, other organizations to, uh, to, 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 to the community engagement process and we invite uh, citizens and residents to the community engagement process. So I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we used to operate a shelter on Queen Street and along Queen Street, we had a number of storefronts uh, for substance abuse and so on. And we decided to purchase a building um, and bring all the services together under one roof, wraparound services, and um, and renovate the building and re repurpose it. And uh, it's the Wagner Green YMCA on 7 Vanali Street, which is Queen, Sp Queen and Spadina. So a lot of unhoused youth, a lot of uh, youth in, in dealing with issues. So the architect, uh, you know, put put together a design for for that building, and we invited the youth who are uh, on the streets or the youth who are using it to come and look at the design, and uh, they they basically told us um, in in very strong words that it sucked. And then they told us why it sucked. And part of the reason we had quite an engagement, part of the reason was we had put the shelter in the basement in barrack style, which is kind of typical. Um, but then they told us what, you know, their experience of being in a basement where some of them may have been abused, they're invisible. Uh, and, and anyway, coming out of the, 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 um, the meeting, we agreed on four principles for the design. Dignity, safety, respect, and hope. And based on that, we redesigned the whole building uh, based on their feedback and input. So that's an example of the importance of community engagement. If we had just gone in and had the design and done it, then it wouldn't it wouldn't be as effective as it is today. Um, so so it's really being open and, and being, you know, and and trying to listen as much as possible. Yeah, and I think um, there's a direct parallel, of course, between that and our um, uh, nascent patient and family engagement work in family medicine um, and in our academic sites and in our department, which is uh, we've just launched um, uh, uh, Tara Kieran in the quality and innovation um, uh, sphere of our department has launched a patient family advisory council. And I think that we're going to be, and all of our sites um, are engaging patients and families in some way and conducting uh, surveys, but there's a lot more that I think we could be doing. And I think you're right that hearing from the people who use the service is profound uh, in the way that it can change uh, your direction. But if you don't ask, then it's not possible to know. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there are a couple of great questions in the Q&A, and the first I'm going to um, uh, rephrase a little bit. Uh, Andrea Phillips says, thank you so much for including dementia in future planning. The need for stimulation in this population is so important. And of course, we know um, that we have an aging population and that the demographics of the people you uh, support and the demographics of the people we support are going to be changing dramatically for the coming 20 years and including a rise in dementia. Um, can you say a little bit about how the Y is approaching or thinks about aging and aging in place and um, any observations you have that you think might be relevant as we think about how family medicine is going to have to shift to serve that aging population? Because as I am fond of saying, no matter how amazing geriatricians are, and they are amazing, they will not be the people who serve the aging population in this country, um, you know, there, we will never have enough of them. Uh, people need to get their care in primary care and in their homes. And so we need to be thinking a, a, as a department about how to shift our education and research uh, and quality programs to acknowledge that reality of, uh, of a shifting demographic. So talk to us about how you think about aging at the Y. Well, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an important question given the demographics and also, you know, given the memberships we have at the Y, a lot of our members are aging. And, and um, uh, a, a couple of things I would say, uh, one, one is we feel that when we're at our best is we ignite three senses, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, and a sense of community. And those three senses are critical throughout life, 
but also for the aging population. So what we're working on right now is uh, what we're calling an older adult strategy to look at um, what can we do um, to ignite those three senses in people. I'm not an expert on dementia, but from what I understand is if, if people have those three senses, they're going to have a better shot at, 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 at aging well. And, um, and, 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 and so that's, that's a really critical piece. The other thing that we're working on in this older adult strategy is um, to move from having people come to us to us going to where people are at. So we're going to be exploring where where are where are where are older adults living? What can we do? Who can we partner with? Can we go into seniors' homes, for example, and provide programming? Uh, and can we? Um, uh, and, and then the third the third element. So it's looking at what people are coming to us, where we can go, and then the, uh, the third element has been the creation of what we call the. Uh, the bright spot, which is an online community for older adults, which is quite quite active, because a lot of older adults are fairly, you know, despite despite the perception, they're more tech savvy than a lot of people, um, and and so uh, the, the the major concern we have is uh, the inequities that we 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 run into, whether it's digital inequity or whether it's um, financial inequity. So. A big part of what we're looking at as well is how to support, how to, how to create access through that. Um, I know it's not a complete answer, but it's really um, how, how we're trying to approach it. That's helpful and it's a great start. Thank you. Um, the the Q and A is um, is growing here, and uh, two terrific uh, questions from Karen Wayman. The first uh, relates to your staff and. Um, we're curious to understand how you're, uh, I mean, are you dealing with the same human resources pressures uh, that we're seeing in other sectors, including in healthcare? And how are you dealing with those at the Y? How are you supporting the well being of your staff? Um, that must have been very challenging in the pandemic when you had to close your doors. Um, for the people who who depend on the why for their living. Um, and just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think about the people who work for you and if you are experiencing shortages, how you're approaching that. Yeah, so we have over 5,000 staff uh, at the Y um, and about 2,000 volunteers. Um, and yes, we, we have, we have uh, levels of burnout and we also have uh, Shortages. Um, I'll give you an example of a shortage in uh, in child care. We have we have thirty five thousand licensed spaces. Uh, we're only right now able to fill seventeen thousand because of staff shortages. Um, so, um, and our 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 child care uh, teachers are incredible. I mean, they were incredible through the pandemic, and they continue to be incredible. So. Uh, so we've we've done a number of things. One one is we've been surveying staff on a regular basis to look at the kind of supports they need. We've been introducing mental health supports for them. We've been introducing greater benefits for them, um, and then we're looking at some recruitment strategies. Uh, so we're 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 you know as, as I mentioned, I'm involved with CAMH, so I always feel like we're talking about the same things. Uh, so uh, you know we've got the same you know, shortages. Uh, the other thing that uh, we've run into with two years of closures, because one of the things we're good at at the Y is developing people, developing young people. With two years of closure, a lot of the young people that would normally have been going through our leadership development program or our uh, counselor and training program, uh, we're not there. So we're almost like starting from 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 scratch, from scratch on that. So so there's 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 a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of strategies and tactics we're we're trying to look at. Well, you've uh, touched on something that's near to the heart of what we do uh, when you mentioned uh, training young people, because of course the core of our mission as a department is education. Uh, and, you know, the thing that we all get up and go to work to do every day uh, alongside taking care of our patients is training the next generation of family physicians. 
So um, do you see opportunities for our department to collaborate with the Y? Can you think about uh, ways where we might be able to work together around uh, doing research? Um, I, I I'm admired your uh, the report that you do with the Wellesley Institute uh, every year on well-being, or not every year, but periodically uh, about well-being in the GTA. We also publish a report once a year uh, related to health and well-being, uh, and uh, it might be interesting to climb. I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas there. I'm not making commitments. Don't worry, anybody. But I, I think, you know, how could we work together on research and on education as we think about training the next generation of family doctors? Um, as Karen Wayman has said, um, there, there must be uh, opportunities to provide education to future healthcare providers in partnership with you. No, I think I think that would be something that uh, I would be keen on exploring, um, and I think uh, there, you know, there, there'll be lots of ideas and lots of uh, uh, lots of platforms for us to look at how how that can be done. Um, so I, I'd be really keen on exploring that. Um, I did I did want to just also mention something around the staffing issue, which is one of the constraints we have is Bill One Twenty Four. Uh, which, because uh, wages are, are, are a challenge. And so uh, that's also something we're trying to figure out how to, how to manage and navigate our way through, uh, through, 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 through that. And I think I'm seeing the same thing in healthcare as well. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, the remuneration issues are a challenge and there are some comments in the Q&A related to remuneration as well. Um, so Brent Elsie raises this around community health centers and coming back to uh, this notion of co-location of services um, in communities. And uh, I know that many uh, neighborhoods in, in Toronto and in other um, uh, parts of the province, including in rural communities, have embraced this notion of community hub in one way or another. So, you know, co-location of social service agencies, um, of community um, community embedded uh, institutions and also healthcare um, and so thinking about um, uh, you know I recently had recently had the chance to visit our site in uh, the the hub in Thorncliffe Park Sarah Downey and I were there together actually in her former role and uh, you know there's some amazing community hub type work work happening all over the province. Um, do you, the pro, one of the things we run into, challenges we run into is how do we pay those doctors? Um, because fee for service is not a, um, a great model uh, for, uh, for working in such environments. Um, do you have any uh, views about that or any, have you um, encountered any creative community solutions to uh, payment in, uh, in community hub type models? Or could you just speak a little bit in general about your experience of community hub? Well, we, we consider many of our lives as community hubs, or we call them centers of community because um, we try to put in wraparound services as much as possible in, in them. Uh, and, and we'd be very keen on partnerships as well with, uh, with, with organizations. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the issues uh, for building community hubs, there is the capital costs required, and there are um, there are avenues for that. Um, we've you know we've we've received some capital support for two thirds of the costs of building the wise, uh, and then we have to raise the other third. But then there's the operating cost, and I think the funders, um, uh, you know. It was it was interesting. We were trying to build um, an expansion on the Green Wagner Y for modular affordable housing for youth, and there's a, there's a request, you know, for capital, but there isn't a commitment from the funders to support the operating costs. So it's uh, it, it's a real challenge and. Um, and, and 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 I think uh, we you know we we're, we're we're trying to figure out solutions for that uh, right now, um, and we want to be careful that, um, with all due respect to government, we don't want to take government off the hook, because sometimes they tell us go 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 do fundraising for that, and um, we you know we want to be careful around 
how much should be fundraising, but you know, where, 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 where does government really need to provide support? So it's a really, conceptually, it's, it's a great concept. It's the funding challenges that uh, make it uh, difficult. Yeah, that's a great point and uh, something I've been thinking about too. What's the, what should be the relative contributions of uh, philanthropy, government, and other sources of funding when you're trying to build something new in community? And uh, um, this is not a paid advertisement, but we do have Michelle D'Emanuel, the Secretary of Cabinet, coming to a subsequent uh, uh, navigate uh, a subsequent uh, session of of this. Uh, of this speaker series. And so I, I won't quote you, Medhat, but I think I will ask her that question because I do think it, it's one of the things that we all struggle with. And she is a former hospital CEO would know that as well as anyone, um, how, how hard it is to figure out what, what's the right source of funding for innovative uh, new models of, uh, of delivering services. Um, Dan, uh, Danielle Raza has asked the question about uh, income polarization and uh, the uh, community, the increasing polarization between communities in the downtown core um, and the inner suburbs of the GTA, something that we, of course, have seen brought uh, into stark relief in the pandemic in terms of uh, differential outcomes, health outcomes, um, uh, infection rates of COVID-19, mortality rates. Um, and we know uh, that access to primary care in the inner suburbs is a huge problem. Um, I want to um, call out the amazing work that our um, faculty members and trainees and leaders in our department are doing uh, in uh, Scarborough, in uh, uh, Mississauga, and uh, where that we're going to be opening a new uh, family medicine teaching unit in Humber River region uh, next year. And so, um, you know, uh, there's much more work to be done there. But uh, Danielle is asking, how does the Y think about that differential between the downtown core and the ring, or as I call it, the donut uh, around the, the uh, center of the city? Well, the, uh, I mean, the, fir the first thing is because we cover the GTA, we have many centers of cities across the GTA. So, uh, you know, we have the city of Mississauga, the city of Toronto. Um, so what, uh, what, what, what we think about, of course, is um, wh wh where, where are their needs? where are their pronounced needs and we, we do that through our research um, and what are the services and partnerships that we we can provide in those in those uh, in those communities um, so we think very 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 much about that um, one of the things that we're able to do when we build a large center is um, almost almost all of our large centers, attract people from multiple communities, multiple neighborhoods. And so, you know, we've got a, we've got a big center in Scarborough, for example. We're building, a, you know, we're building one in Scarborough Agent Court, but we've got one, you know, in downtown Scarborough. We have one in downtown Mississauga. And when you look at um, the, uh, the, the, the ring of people that we can reach out to, uh, is is one way we try to, to to make sure there's a there's a mixture of people from different neighborhoods in in, in the Y. So, uh, but it, it's it, it's a really tough work in progress um, because uh, you know the pandemic has really amplified some of those uh, you know, some of those gaps and uh, and 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 so it, it's 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 really um, it's really um, challenging. Uh, and the other thing is, is you know, we, we have, for example, in Jane and Finch, we have three childcare centers. Um, so we also look at hiring locally as well, uh, and and, and do, doing what we can to to kind of bring, you know, some a bit of economic development to 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 to, to those communities. And of course, we have a very robust. Financial assistance program, so you know, nobody nobody's turned away. So, so those are those are ways, uh, but I think it's a much bigger systemic problem um, that really requires uh, a real focus, uh, um, multi pronged focus. It's an interesting uh, thing to reflect on the notion of 
the why or a healthcare organization as a driver of economic development, which of course is true, but is not perhaps how we would often conceive of ourselves. I know that um, in rural Canada, in many, many communities, the hospital is the major employer and it's the major um, uh, generator of good jobs uh, with decent working conditions and a living wage. Um, and so when hospital closures um, occur in rural communities, it's not just about the devastation of access to services, it's also about the loss of those jobs. I'm not sure we've thought about family medicine in those terms, um, but perhaps we should. And certainly if family medicine is increasingly linked into other health and social services in uh, models like the hub uh, type model we've been talking about, um, then I think those places do become major economic drivers and places where local people can um, grow their careers in addition to accessing services. So I like that, um, uh, that notion of expanding how we think about ourselves, not just as uh, service providers, but also as um, employers who can um, pay a living wage. That's really great. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've only got a, a, probably about two minutes left, and so I'll, I'll finish with um, with a final question to you, Medhat, which is uh, just to say, if if you could have your pick of uh, things you would like to see an academic department of family medicine do to better serve communities, what would your advice be to us? Oh, well, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, I, I, I think I think uh, I would I would say two or three things just sort of off the top of my head. One, one is uh, making sure we embed uh, training on mental health, uh, uh, so so that we can get more mental health supports out in in different in different ways across uh, across the system. Uh, you know, at KMH we say mental health is health. So how, how can we have a health unit without mental health literacy and mental health support? So, um, so that would be one thing I would I would I would say. And then the other thing I would say is um, uh, let's pick some partnership ideas and pilot something. And. Um, I know as Canadians, we love to pilot things, right? We're not quite sure we want to make the full commitment yet, right? So, but uh, let's uh, let's let's figure out how we can pilot some partnerships around uh, education and teaching. Um, you know, what, one of uh, one of the things I was thinking about as well is like, this. This sounds very simple, but if we if we place um, family practice units in YMCA's then uh, the staff in those family practice units get to use the Y. So, so they, they also build their own health and well-being. Um, and, and like there's a lot of synergies that can be created uh, across, uh, across the board. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a lot of synergy and you know, my, my experience with uh, family practice was through Women's College Hospital. Dr. Ruderman, you recall him. I know you were one of his uh, one of his uh, colleagues. But this idea of this sort of place where you can go and they know you, and they know your family, and they know you through your history, uh, you know, is really it is really the gem of uh, great family practice. And uh, I recall, I recall when my you know. You know, our, our family practice doctor delivered all our children, advised our children as they were getting older, looked at it like it's, it's, it's really, it, it's really, it's really, it's really powerful if we can, if we can get that done. I mean, you're speaking directly to our hearts because that is how we like to conceive of ourselves, um, you know, walking that whole journey of life with, uh, with people and their families. And I must say your, your, your vision of collaborating together, you know, and uh, I, I know it's just, um, we're, we're just uh, spitballing ideas, but this, this concept of uh, embedding family medicine into YMCAs, because that's where community lives and that's where people are um, in their neighborhoods is such a, it stands 
in such stark contrast to the notion of a family practice in a big box store or even a family practice in some back room at a pharmacy. Um, it feels so, so much more community embedded um, and so much more connected to health to me uh, personally. And so um, I, I hope that we will have the opportunity to, to work and collaborating, uh, to work and collaborate together. Um, Medhat, thank you. This has been such a rich conversation and we've learned so much from you. Uh, we're so grateful for, for you and for the work of the Y in our communities. And um, uh, so thank you for spending this time with us this morning. And um, we, uh, we hope that all of you will come to uh, our next sessions in uh, next month, we'll be hosting a special uh, session related to the launch of our strategic plan. And then stay tuned for upcoming sessions, uh, as I mentioned, with Michelle D'Emmanuel, the highest uh, ranking civil servant in the province, and uh, Dr. Beth Coleman, who does unbelievable work on uh, data and cities. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful Friday. Thank you.